Speaker today in chapel is Reverend Don Southern, President and Chief Executive Officer of the American Track Society since uh, January 1995. Dan and the ATS staff focus on reaching today's world with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ through tracks. And as, ordained, as an ordained minister, Dan preaches and teaches evangelism to encourage Christians whenever and wherever he is able to do so. And he does this using scripture, practical ideas, and inspiring examples, along with a great passion for the gospel. Before coming to the American Track Society, Dan served nearly 20 years as a crusade organizer with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And in that role, he traveled and lived in communities around the world, preparing for area-wide evangelistic outreach. As part of his ministry with ATS, Dan works closely with other Christian groups seeking to organize effective evangelistic events. Dan and his wife, Lori, live in Allen, Texas with their two children, Adam and Tyler. He loves to spend time with his family and especially enjoys the sporting events in which his children are involved. Delighted to have you here today, Dan, and I want all of you to join with me in welcoming Dan Southern to Dallas Seminary. Thank you. After an introduction like that, I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. It ought to be good. I also feel a little intimidated. I've got all these professors up here, homiletics, among other things. And so uh, I'm going to endeavor to preach the gospel so clearly that even a PhD can understand it. <clears throat> I want to turn your attention to Matthew 4.19, and I didn't bring my family Bible, so you're just going to have to trust me on this, okay? You can look it up. Hopefully you already have hidden this verse in your heart. Jesus is beginning his ministry, and he's walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he encounters some fishermen, and he says very simply to them, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Will you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, we now come humbly before you, asking you to use us, speak through us, and that you would speak to us, and we pray that we would be different after we've gone away from this place, in Christ's name, amen. I just want to mention a couple of tracks that are very current, the Da Vinci Code. We have uh, one by Dr. Bach here at the seminary and one by Hank Hanegraaff. And one of the things that I want to impress upon you today is that we designed this resource so that it goes to work by itself. All we need are willing hands and feet. But in order to get those hands and feet working, we've got to have a heart that's in place. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. If I ever get invited back, I'll talk to you more about how but today I just want to share with you briefly about what I think is one of the greatest needs in the church today. I have the privilege of traveling widely and seeing a lot of different things going on in the body of Christ, and I can't think of a greater need today than the need for us to follow the leader. What I want to do is just give you a couple of ideas based on this scriptural text, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. John Maxwell says that everything rises or falls on leadership. And as people who are preparing to be leaders, who are leading now, we need to be aware of the enormous power that we've got. I just came away from my father's deathbed. He's dying of cancer. And as I looked at him there in the bed, a couple of things occurred to me. First of all, I was glad that my father knew Jesus as his Savior. Secondly, I was thankful that he was an example to me of winning many people to Christ. I'll never forget opening his Bible, unbeknownst to him, and in the fly, name after name, date after date of people who he had led to Christ. Secondly, 
uh, or thirdly, I should say, my dad is very weak and frail. In fact, he is just about there at heaven's gate. And I thought how weak and frail we all are in comparison to our Heavenly Father. And yet we feel strong, we feel intellectually ready, and yet God can brush us off of his sleeve like a grasshopper. We only serve at his pleasure. And sometimes we take pride in our strength, but we're really weak. I thought also that my father can no longer serve because it's no longer day for him. The Bible says, work while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. And you and I are rapidly approaching that time. In our own life, we don't know when that will be, but we also look forward to his soon return. And then lastly, I was reminded that our Heavenly Father will come soon, and we have to be ready for his appearing. He's given us that opportunity. So let me just give you a couple of ideas. I've worked alongside pastors and ministry leaders all of my adult career, and I want to give you some observations that are disturbing to me. Now, I know seminaries get blamed for a lot of things. I'm not here in any way to cast aspersions at the wonderful and effective job that seminaries do, and this seminary in particular. Many people who are very close to me are products of this seminary, and it is doing a wonderful job, and I'm honored to be here. But I have a message that I believe is important for all, all of us to hear. And the first one is that most Christians don't evangelize. Most Christians don't evangelize. And in fact, most Christian leaders don't evangelize. And in fact, most pastors don't evangelize. And I want to ask you to just reflect on this question. Why aren't we doing that which is closest to the heart of God? And the answer is probably because we're insecure and weak and fearful and we figured out a way around it and we have become comfortable with our logic, but it's not biblical and it's not effective and it will ruin our ministry. Somebody told me in, in working for Billy Graham, you know, you get to be a little bit self-confident. You go into a meeting and everybody pays attention to you and you think you're pretty smart after a while. So he came to me after a short time, an old man with very little hair left, and he said, you know something? Nobody can give you a ministry. <clears throat> your ministry flows out of your life. And I'd like to put that across to you today. Unless you have a vital relationship with Jesus Christ, your ministry will be nothing. And so that's what we have to strive for. Why don't Christians evangelize? Well, my premise is because their leaders don't do it. And their leaders don't talk about it. And this is where I want to challenge you this morning. Uh, Barna, who's got a lot of statistics, and I'm not sure where they all come from sometimes, but we'll use them because they support what I want to say today, <laughs> says that 50% of the people sitting in church this Sunday cannot articulate the gospel. 50%. Maybe that's why people aren't sharing the gospel. They don't know what it is. Where are they supposed to find that information? Well, if they don't read their Bible, they're getting it from the pulpit. I find it interesting that pastors say tracts, for example, aren't effective. But in those same statistics from Barna, they say preaching isn't effective. And I have to wonder why they're preachers if it's not effective. It all depends on the messenger, in my view, and it depends on our connectivity to God through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you come after me, if you follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. So first of all, if you're not fishing, you're not following. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is the one that does this work in our life. It's not a discipline, and it's not an outline. Those things facilitate the working of the Holy Spirit, but the first thing is to be so full of God that we flow out onto other people. And so this is where we have to find our resource. The gospel, Paul said, is the power of God unto salvation. So don't use clever arguments, great illustrations, and leave out the gospel. You've left out the very core. 
Now, pastors have a legitimate reason for not being great evangelists because evangelism is a gift, the gift of an evangelist. However, I should say the evangelist is a gift. Evangelism is not a gift. Evangelism is a calling. We are all to be evangelizers. Jesus came into the world and gave himself to fulfill his highest calling. God gave his greatest resource to evangelize the world. That must be our first priority. Now, if you use tracks or not, I'm going to get into that in a moment. That's not of principal concern to me. My question is, are you following Jesus? Is the Holy Spirit flowing out of your life onto others? Are you an evangelizer? And then are you modeling it? Are you talking about it so your people will do the same thing? If you aren't doing it, they won't do it. It's just that simple. And I meet very few pastors who do it any place apart from the pulpit. But I want to know, what are you doing in your personal time when you're not getting paid to be an evangelist? What are you doing in your personal life? What about your neighbor? What about your mailman? Do you even know who your neighbors are or your mailman's name? It's hard, I realize, to keep up with those things, but that is our mission field. What about your own family, your greatest mission field? How are you doing? I've got some resources that will help you. Most Christian leaders don't evangelize. We are all to be evangelizers, and anybody can be an evangelizer. You may not have all the skill sets to be a Billy Graham, but you have all the skill sets that God wants you to have to be able to perform the task that he's given you, which is to be a fisher of men. And so what you have to do is figure out how to use your skills to fulfill your calling. Now, my wife is a great person for giving things away. I didn't think of that as a gift for quite a while in our early marriage. <laughs> I thought of that as somewhat of a vice, and I was out to correct her. And so I'd say, now, sweetheart, it's okay to do that, but do you think you might have gotten a little carried away? You know, did you have to give them everything in the refrigerator? Could you have just narrowed it down to a pie or something? And then the thought dawned on me. This is a gift that my wife has. God's put this in her life, and she builds friendships with it, and I need to harness this and encourage it and cultivate it so that my gifts alongside hers can be effective in reaching the people God has placed around us. She's not bold and won't start a conversation always about spiritual things, but she can get her foot in the door, and I can't even get them to look out except through the peephole sometime. And so together we are discovering how we use our... Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Have you identified them? Are you tapping into them to the glory of God? And then I want you to think in terms of those who are evangelizers in your church or even evangelists. Because many times those with the gift of an evangelist lack a lot of personal social skills. In fact, as president of the Track Society, I work with a lot of very kooky people. I'll be quite honest with you. I'm not one of them, but I work with them. <laughs> you know, they might need to take a bath or need to iron their clothes or need to use some kind of breath mint or not get too close in your personal space. A lot of things about them that want to be marginalized in our local church. So when this person comes up and says, Pastor, you're not talking enough about the gospel, we say, right, yes, thank you, brother. Would you help him over here? And we just get him out of the way. And we marginalize these people, and we cut them off from the body life in our churches so that our church now doesn't have the benefit of their zeal and their gifting, and we're not doing the work of the kingdom. The other thing is Satan uses their deficiencies to blunt their effectiveness. And they need the body to help them get educated in how much space to give a person and how to start a conversation and maybe how often to wash their clothes. I don't know. But you see what I'm saying? We've got evangelists who've been marginalized, evangelizers who have convinced themselves that they really don't have the gift and so they're not effectively working in the community. I'll never forget going into a little shop in my town up there in Allen, and I shared a gospel tract with the owner, just as an icebreaker. And he said, no thanks, I'm already a Christian. 
And I said, oh, really? I said, well, then how about if I, I said, that's great news. I said, how about if I leave this with you so you can share it with somebody else? He says, no, he says, I'm not a talker, I'm a doer. And I just couldn't help it. <laughs> I said, you know, I've been in your store 15 minutes and I had no idea you were a Christian until you told me so. Maybe we need to think about re-examining this idea of just letting our light shine. Now, Paul says, be imitators of Christ. And if we were truly imitators, then people would be drawn to that light. But the fact is, your light and my light don't shine that bright. And so if we're going to just rely on letting our light shine, we're going to fail. Somebody has to open their mouth at some point and say, this is what God says. This is the gospel. And then the other thing that people use to hide behind is this idea of friendship evangelism. Oh, I can't witness to them. That's hit and run. I've got to have a deep personal relationship before I can do any evangelizing. Well, first of all, we know Christians don't have any relationships with people out in the world, do we? You, have, you survey the average Christian, they'll say, I don't have any unsaved friends. Secondly, we don't know what we would do if we did recognize that they were unsaved. It's just a smokescreen. Friendship evangelism is good. It's great. It's the ideal scenario. But here's the problem. Go back to what King David said. I look to my right. Now, who is on your right? Well, your right-hand man, your closest friend. He said, refuge had failed me. No one cared for my soul. Now, here is... God's favorite son, and he's got nobody. And I just have to wonder about all those people out in the world that don't have a Christian friend, and nobody cares for their soul. Somebody's got to care, and I think that's you and me. So I don't let the fact that I don't know somebody stop me from sharing the gospel. They need it more than anybody else. Now, that doesn't mean I have to be shallow and have no friends and just go for people who are strangers but it means I must not neglect people that I don't have a friendship with. I can have a two-second friendship. I can have a five-minute friendship. I can have an hour friendship. Whatever I can establish to build a bridge, that's what I'm going to do. I'll never forget a guy named John who was driving me from my car to the ticket counter at the airport. I had a three-minute friendship with him. When I got off, I took a gospel tract, I placed a dollar bill in it, and I said, here's something for you, and if you have any spare time today, you might enjoy reading this. He followed me off the bus. This is with other people in the trolley waiting to get to their gate. He said, hey, are you a Christian? And I said, yes. He said, I'd like to become a Christian. So I didn't say, now, wait a minute. Are you sure you know what you're talking about here? <laughs> Let's go through some scripture." No, I didn't do that. I said, do you understand that you're a sinner who needs a Savior and that you can trust Christ for your place in heaven? He said, yes. And I said, let's pray right now. So in 30 seconds, he prayed to receive Christ. I see him now every once in a while, and he always asks me for more gospel tracts that he can share with his co-workers there at the airport. Now, I wouldn't say that was a very effective relationship I had with him, except that he came to know Christ. In fact, if he'd have known me better, he might never have asked me. <laughs> so, friendship evangelism is good, but don't use it as a smokescreen. Now, I have many more things to say and only five minutes in which to say it, so I'm going to go very quickly here, and I'm going to ask you to think about the leadership that God has placed on you as a pastor or a church leader. When you stand up before people and you're giving them knowledge and you're giving them teaching and insight from the Word, are you also giving them a life that is to be modeled? Are you telling them that you love your neighbor so much that you're invested in them and you're talking to them about Christ? Are you telling them about your failures to be effective in sharing the gospel? Boy, I have a lot more of those to talk about than successes. But everyone can be a learning opportunity. And so I'm transparent and I admit to people, I missed three opportunities today that I'm keenly aware of. I was on the plane the other day with uh, Dick Armey, senator here in Texas, and I 
pulled out a tract and I was going to go talk to him and I decided I shouldn't do it because I would be showing favoritism. Now isn't Satan subtle? I didn't get anything done because I was afraid of not doing everything. I'm going to have to live with that. You're going to have to live with your failures, but God can use them, as Paul said, to help us move forward in our spiritual life and not backwards. I do have some good news. Occasionally, I take advantage of the opportunity. I was just very discouraged one day. I'd missed a flight, and I went into the uh, little room where you can wait for your flights, and who did I run into but Simon Cowell from American Idol. I just happened to have a Who's Your Idol gospel track right in my pocket. <laughs> So I was able to share with him. In fact, I followed him, and he went into a room with Randy and Paula. They all got the gospel that day. So I felt pretty good about that one. But on other occasions, I mess up terribly. I mess up when people don't give me the service I want, and I get angry, and therefore I can't talk about Christ because I've been such a poor example. Or I fail just because I don't feel like it. I'm too tired. But here's the thing. Whether I like it or not, people are following me. I'm setting a pattern. I'm the leader. Who's your leader? Jesus Christ. What did he say? Come and follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. Today we have a gospel tract and a little tip book, 10 tips on how you can effectively use tracts. Why should you use tracts? You have all the theology in the world. Well, for one thing, theology can be an impediment to being an effective evangelizer. Uh, E.V. Hill used to say about Billy Graham, you know, the people would say, Billy Graham's not very deep. And he'd say, the fish ain't down deep. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is that maybe, maybe you and I need to keep it real simple so that we can get it right out there very quickly and let somebody respond. We don't have to do all the work. The last time I checked, this was the work of the Holy Spirit. But you and I are the hands and feet. So we have to proffer the gospel. We have to offer it. But we don't have to convince. We don't have to persuade. God's been working in their life before you showed up, and he's going to keep on working after you're there. What you want to do is capture the opportunity that God's presented. So I'm giving you a tract, and I'm asking you to take that today and find one person that you can share it with, just one person. My goal is to share the gospel with at least one person every day. If I get 10 in one day, I take nine days off. <laughs> no. I start over every day, just like I do when I fail and don't do any. Are you with me? What's your plan? What is your plan? You say, well, I don't like tracks. Well, I like my lousy plan better than your no plan. <laughs> okay? According to Operation World, more than half of all the people who come to Christ, literature plays a significant role. I'm going to say that if you're the biggest coward in the universe, you can still use tracks because they're designed to go to work without you. In fact, they might work better without you. <laughs> What we want to do is get the gospel in circulation. Paul said, I'm not afraid of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it because it is the power of God unto salvation. Let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we wish we had more time. We've got so much more to say. But I pray that your spirit has quickened our hearts to realize that no one will give us a ministry. It will flow out of our life, and really out of our relationship with you. Holy Spirit, quicken us, use us, fill us, so that we could be fishers of men. In Jesus' name, amen.